I get a lot of people emailing me saying, is it normal like to feel like this is PTSD after breaking up with someone so dysfunctional? And um, it's part of the reason why I make videos like this and perhaps for you as well. It's when you've witnessed this, when you've witnessed friends, when you yourself have gone through this, it's one of the hardest things you could ever do, recovering from a breakup with someone very traumatized. No, I, I completely agree. Like me personally, um, I take it from personal experience because I tend to get really traumatized uh, given my upbringing. At the same time, I also tend to fall for and to be attracted to uh, people on the cluster B side of the personality traits. So uh, I have to be very self-aware and very self-conscious of who I attract. And thankfully, um, the person I'm seeing now, um, she's currently in Chile. We're trying to get her over here, you know, whole immigration stuff. Uh, oh, you're going through it as well. Oh, okay. Best uh, of luck to you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you understand. And then yeah. um, thankfully, she's very, very secure. Uh, so that's a very different transition for me. But one of the things I found in the relationship was uh, it was very prone to boredom at the very beginning. Because I'm, I'm used to putting out these fires. I'm used to um, constantly being on the go. So having that, that adjustment. And I knew the content and I knew what I was going to go through. But knowing it academically and then going through it emotionally is two very different things. Um, and that's usually when I, um, I started coaching on this channel before I, I moved stateside and then I had to stop the coaching because of the, the visa restrictions. But uh, it was a very good transition for me in the sense that I started getting a better understanding of connection and relationships. But at the same time, it was interesting for me to not be um, constantly spinning my wheels on a daily basis and I, I i'm sure that someone like yourself completely empathizes with that but uh it's an interesting perspective from the outside looking in it's another thing altogether when you're living at first hand it's hard and just to address what you said your level of self-awareness and honesty like hey you know what i tend to get attracted to people in the class of b spectrum all yeah. right it's it's honest because it's this is the unfortunate truth. It's when we have parents who are a certain way, when we're exposed to seeing how people like that interact. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and we have their DNA as well. We, we watch how people are. How can we not be attracted to people who are similar to people in our past? And um, I think it's wise to see this because a lot of people whom I work with are kept in a spiral of shame that stops them from looking at themselves honestly. And in my experience, the more honest we can be about looking at ourselves, the easier it is to see someone's truth, really. The, the more we can see truth in ourselves, the easier it is to see truth in others. Absolutely. Um, just so, so you're aware on my background, uh, I grew up in a narcissistic household. So my mother is, uh, Richard and I had this conversation. We shouldn't call them coverts anymore. We should just call them narcissists. But um, basically, uh, yeah, we, we call, uh, she was a covert narcissist and was always having a parasitic lifestyle with the men in her life. And um, through extension, my sisters uh, shared some of her traits. Uh, so uh, two of my sisters, I would say, fall under that, that, um, that characterization now, although I don't like to throw labels out there. And one of them has a, and the one that isn't, is a heavy codependent um, with heavy substance abuse problems. So there's, there's an element here that, look, there's an extension of that, of that trauma, um, especially growing up and the lack of bonding and the superficialness and the manipulations. Oh, so much manipulation uh, growing mm -hmm. up. And I probably didn't unlearn that part of social dynamics until I was probably in my late 20s because I thought manipulation was normal. And that's really um, <laughs> the things that I had to unlearn uh, in order to find some level of stability. But uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware, and as I'm sure you can speak of, uh, when you're traumatized to that extent at such an early age, you, you normalize it and you think it's completely normal. And then as you get older and as you peek away from the nest and, and start finding your individuality, uh, you start realizing, oh, the, the world is not as screwed up as, as it is back home. And then you have two options. Either you can double down, which I did for a number of years, or you can make your voice heard. And usually that voice heard comes at the expense of narcissistic rage from, from the family head. So here we are. Well, yes. And ultimately what's worked for me is 
finding balance within ourselves really it's healing the inner template we have for mother and father because once we've left the family home we parent ourselves and what is that template it's it's based on how our parents treated us our words are repeated in how we speak to ourselves and how we treat ourselves so we need to unlearn old habits and relearn new habits in theory it's easy to do it's a case of stopping old habits and patterns and replacing them with new ones but there is a massive resistance in doing this the problem when you come out of this relationship it's when you get stuck in overthinking this it just creates a whole hell it makes it a lot lot worse so seeking balance in this sense would be actually taking time out to recover physically come back into your body take time to just spend time with friends chill out i mean i i, I spent time after when i broke up with someone with BPD I, uh, I couldn't date for a few years I was hanging out with my mates and watching a lot of wrestling and um, gaming and you know what no regrets yeah. no regrets at all well maybe watching WWE but um, I, I, I needed the time to distract myself and spend time with like safe calm people and then I was able to like move on from that so you know go at your pace just watch out for getting stuck in obsessional thinking and at the same time which was the case for me I did get a bit lazy I started my business my counseling business but yeah I did get stuck in inertia and that's what a lot of clients are facing as well when they're just stuck in inertia after a terrible breakup I, I can totally totally relate to that and one of the problems I usually ran into is when I would find myself in these cluster B relationships and and leave them um, the natural reaction is to go back to the nest, to go back to um, go back to the homestead to, to gain some support. But even then, you're getting reinforced these values that that you inherently don't agree with. Because I, I don't consider myself a narcissist. <laughs> I, I can only speak for myself. But um, the certain elements like empathy and, and being able to put myself in in someone else's shoes was heavily discouraged. So let's try to put some distance between you and this person, regardless of how you emotionally feel about them, because you're not in a, a mental state to think about this logically. I keep, uh, I'll throw some examples out here. <laughs> People that have given me an entire list of, of nasty things that their partners have done, cheated, stolen money, um, taken the kids, um, smear campaign them. These things add up and, and they're incredibly traumatizing. And for someone that's in an emotional state where they just aren't ready to let go yet, um, it can be incredibly traumatizing in itself of, of looking at someone and realizing you didn't quite know them. So I'm interested in the purpose of you as a counselor. What did you find worked best for your clients to help distance themselves emotionally from their ex? To, um, well, it's working through their feelings so that they could get to a place of indifference, really. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a video on this on my channel about the different stages of a breakup related to the different stages of grieving. And the final stage really is acceptance. And with that, a sense of indifference that, you know, you don't really, you're not so emotionally invested anymore in this. Mm -hmm. But before one can get to this point, it's working with the emotions and the thoughts that fuels each other, the, the thoughts that can randomly come up, the feelings that just randomly come up, they create a lot of energy. and where we focus our attention, it builds up even more energy, which amplifies the emotions, and one of which is anger. Mm -hmm. And the um, thing about personality disorders, this is just my opinion, my own personal thought on this, it is a spectrum, in my opinion, plus to be personality disorders. And um, the further we get further down the spectrum, the more lost one is in this, it closes one's heart, one's heart center, on an emotional, energetic level, perhaps even on a physical level, it can have an impact. I'm a holistic healer like that, I believe so. It does have an impact on your heart center and it's important to keep it open. It's important to keep reminding yourself that there is good in the world, to have compassion, to have empathy. It's not easy to do though, especially when we're invested in overthinking like revenge thoughts and anger and bitterness. However, at the same time, the anger does serve a purpose because I do have clients who are so depressed, they're in, in inertia, the anger serves as a wake-up call, like, you know, gives you energy. It's, it's an active feeling, isn't it? Gets you into action. So it's finding balance, like I said. It's so important to find balance where we can 
sit with the anger. What is it teaching us? Can we shift it from a, neur a neurotic anger, that is anger and bitterness about overthinking past events? Can we shift it to existential anger, that is anger at not living as how we're meant to be, not living as our authentic self, allowing people to be mistreating us? You know, this is a healthy anger, but it needs to be like a, a burst of it. And then you apply it, you channel it into living the life you want to live. And then it needs to be let go of. Mm -hmm. problem of past with a breakup it's it's too easy to get invested in just obsessional thinking about that person and this will hold you back the more you keep thinking about this person the more you're going to keep this person alive in your head mm -hmm. so it's finding a balance finding time to think about it and then let it go finding time to talk about it and then letting it go and what do you think <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts. I, I can hear I can feel you thinking which which I love by the way I, I love people that think on their feet because um it's more authentic I find um oh like, yeah thank you I don't plan this I just shoot yeah. from the hip yeah, it, yeah it comes from the heart what can I say yeah. it's like I still have a heart oh my god <laughs> um <laughs> but, but, keeping a spiritual practice whatever you want to call it of keeping your heart open I find it's the most helpful thing not just recovering from the relationship but just in life it's progressing mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, one of the things that I, I really related to you was um, you, you talking about anger and anger serving a purpose. And one of the things I usually have to tell tell people, especially when they they feel um, an incredible sense of guilt, because there's this this element of, oh, I'm angry at my ex and my ex wasn't a bad person. And then when you actually sit down with them and ask them list all the things that happened, you say, no, oh, you have every right to be angry it's a question of not whether you're going to be angry it's a question of whether you're going to stay angry and yeah, yeah that's it, like i'll give i'll give people credit like you know give me a couple of months of, of really being angry at this person that uh, that screwed me over but after those couple of months i expect you to come up with a solution like uh, one of the rules i have on my discord is you're allowed to complain but you have to come up with a a solution to the problem even if that solution is long term you have to find something and people struggle with this and one thing that i don't like about youtube and, and i'm slowly distancing myself from certain individuals that i've recommended in the past is um there's this encouragement of spiral like behavior of obsessing over someone and there's no long-term goal and a lot of times, uh, you usually get individuals who will come and say, this is what you need to do, da, 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 and they think that's the end of the, uh, the conversation. Well, it's not that easy, first off. And second off, it, it also takes a uh, consistency and routine. So what I usually tell people is routines is going to be your saving grace out of this, at least initially. So you have to write them down and you have to uh, essentially follow through on them. At the same time, uh, if you're still obsessing over someone three months, four months after a breakup, when your brain should have built new neurons by then, um, usually that's that's a key indicator of CPTSD, in my opinion. So based on that, I might recommend that they go see a counselor that specializes in that, or they might seek out treatment. Um, I'm not a doctor by any means, so I, I won't recommend medication. But I will say maybe you should see a specialist about this because you need to cover every single avenue. Like um, I, I'm OCD by nature. So if I get into something, I will read the crap out of it until there's no tomorrow. And when it came to things like narcissism, it was the same thing. I, I indulged and I absorbed all that information like a sponge, but I didn't know when to say when. And I had to self-regulate after about six months of saying, I don't know. I have enough information now i need to move forward what what's your opinion on helping people that seem to be caught in spirals like this yeah i do get people who really struggle with thinking about this and they are traumatized people themselves and this is unfortunately the nature of trauma it's, it's ptsd it's a shock it's we're still shocked a part of us is still stuck there so i mean what helps for me personally and what's helped with some other people um, is finding meaning and purpose, in my opinion. Um, for what? For what has the suffering been for? Have I seen a side of me now that perhaps I didn't see before? And I can work with this now because, in my opinion, I trained in psychosynthesis counseling, which means synthesis of the psyche. When we're wounded, when we're traumatized, 
we lose ourselves in it. Yeah. Perhaps we lose ourselves in the adaptive self that was created to survive chaotic family. But through dissociation, through splitting, projecting, we lose part of ourselves. We don't see ourselves. So the healing process is to be able to see ourselves really and take it all back and integrate at a higher, more stable level. And I find finding meaning is a good way to do that. And it keeps our heart open as well. Um, so whether that is one spiritual practice, whether that's just developing a certain philosophy of life, perhaps it's learning to be a bit more optimistic now and um, willing to eat a slice of humble pie and really look at ourselves and thinking, am I similar to my ex maybe? Maybe I should stop focusing and pointing the finger and realize three fingers pointing back at me. Maybe I should look at myself now. And when we do that, we're then empowered to do it make a change. If you get burned on the stove five times and you put your hand there a sixth time, I'm going to tell you, you know, you need to stop doing that. But if this is your first time and you don't know any better, there's mm -hmm. an element of self-forgiveness that needs to take place in understanding. But this is the lacking of, of people that have grown up in that codependent dynamic with families that they have been purposely suppressing those emotions in order to accommodate someone else. Well, exactly. It's like the child can't have its own needs because it needs to be constantly available for the parent who doesn't have self-regulate. This is at the crux of codependency. It's like these two people, like if you move, I'll fall over. Um, and that's what the parent wants to facilitate. They want the child to become dependent. And it's understandable, the child growing up, feeling rage at not being allowed to <laughs> individuate because it's normal. It's unnatural to not individuate. A lot of the the anger and the resentment growing up, I was blamed for a lot of it. And uh, there was just this natural deflection from the family saying, this is a you problem. This is not a we problem. This is not us versus you. Um, you're holding us accountable for things that happened 10 years ago. Uh, and then looking back on it, I'm, I'm saying, well, in a certain sense, they're correct. This is, did happen 10 years ago, but this is a big impact uh, to my psyche and who I am. And if you can't respect that, if you can't appreciate and acknowledge that there's pain there, this relationship needs to end. There's, there's no benefit in it for me. Um, and that's something that, that took me years to come to the conclusion to because I didn't have that support system. So that's what I hope that a channel like my, my channel and your channel and your other alternative channel are doing to people and helping um, them through this traumatic experience. We're not taught this in schools, are we, about personality disorders and narcissistic abuse and all that. Um, yeah. we're, taught, we're taught about Freud and even that's if we take a psychology course. So everyone thinks that psychology is an association with sex and every stretch of the word. And it's just like, no, it's, that's not all of it. <laughs> like that's maybe the, the, the unconscious part of the brain. But if we're dealing with the subconscious and specifically if we're dealing with trauma like that, that's something that's huge. And children in particular have a way of acting out um, in school settings. And of course, uh, teachers do their best and most of them are underpaid. They, they don't have that training or even that knowledge base. It's not part of the curriculum. It's not part of their training activity. So yeah, you're absolutely right. We're not taught about PTSD. We're not taught about cluster B or narcissism. We really should be though. Usually what I tell people is that their saving grace are the routines. But what I also tell people is that in times of trauma, these are the times where your brain is most prone to changing physically. So if you want to instill good routines and, and positive habits, this is the time to do it. And uh, a lot of people don't see that, that positive out of it. And I know when you're in the moment, it's almost impossible to see the positive out of it. But what I usually tell people is, look, you're, you're only going to have a traumatic event like this probably a handful of times, at least hopefully a handful of times if you're healthy. Um, so these are the moments that you can actually change, you know, your, your health habit, mm -hmm. your mental well-being or your thinking patterns. Um, I know myself going back to that CPTSD notion, my inner critic used to be my mother's voice. And that took about, you know, good five, six years of, of therapy and reflection to finally get rid of it. Um, but that aspect is, it was only possible because of a traumatic event. So there's some positivity coming out of, of a toxic situation is that you can redefine yourself and redefine what you see uh, yourself as being in this world. And to your point, uh, finding that sense of purpose. If you're able to do that, the sky's the limit, but uh, you have to put in the work. Well, exactly. It's... <laughs> If it was that easy, if you didn't have to put the work in, I wouldn't be in a job. We have to um, 
put in the daily practices. But what helps, okay, in my opinion, what really helps, especially after a breakup, is to do activities that give you an instant boost of self-esteem. And that are things that um, you can complete within a day. Or maybe it's working on a, an instrument or a hobby that you maybe put to one side and now you can focus on it again. Doing things in the day that we can get done and working on things which we see improvements in that boosts our sense of self-esteem. And this in turn uh, gives us a increased boost of personal power and we start to like feel better again. And that really helps increase our sense of will to do things, even the smallest of tasks. If you're really depressed and you're struggling to get out of bed, just getting into a habit of just brushing your teeth in the morning and choosing a healthier option to eat maybe and making sure you're hydrated. And just doing that and sticking to that, that in itself is rewarding, you know. Maybe it's just baby steps you need, but it's direction, in my opinion, and not speed that is the most important.